I think it is a, a given that the only people who really like station wagons in South Africa are motoring journalists. We love them. We see them. We, you could pick them out in a parking lot and like everybody gravitates towards the station wagon immediately. I mean, I had it. I landed in Copenhagen uh, oh. a year or two ago. And the first thing we noticed when we walked out of the airport was all of the E-class station wagons. The oh. guys stopped and took photos of them because it's not something that we see. I mean, mm. my parents had a station wagon. Uh, ah. Toyota Corolla flipping thing was as long as a cruise ship, but it was also it because worked. yes, you had all that boot space plus the rear seat plus the front seat. Welcome back to another fabulous episode of the ATP podcast. We got a lot to discuss today. My name is Mr. Tayed Zambiri, and I'm here with the man with the Alpine Stars boots, the ones that were made for stomping. Mr. Lawrence Minnie, how are you doing? Oh, always good to be back, Tay. I like it. Well, I'm glad you do. So we've got quite a bit to discuss today. First, in hot or not, we're going to be talking about vans. They sound hot, do they not? Well, they're very useful. Indeed. And also just the demise of station wagons in South Africa. Then on to yes, but no, where we'll be discussing Bike rider gear. Lawrence, that's up your alley. Get ready for that. In Heat Seekers, we're going to be chatting about Samola Hill Climb. What's going to be cracking there? And what is my dear colleague Lawrence getting up to over there? And last but not least, Ask Auto Trader. So let's get into it. So, Lawrence, vans. In particular, the new Ford Transit and Torneo has been announced. It's already for sale in South Africa. And here's the thing with the new Torneo right over here. Doesn't that look real nice as far as vans go? Looks very similar to the last one. Still cool though. But anyways, so this comes with a two liter turbo diesel engine, 100 kilowatts, 360 newton meters, the Eco Blue with Ad Blue, might I add. Yes. Now, looking at this inside and out, it is by the numbers modern car. We've got a massive infotainment touchscreen, and we've also got the practicality that a Transit or a Torneo offers. And the Transit has been around for a while. You even had one on test. So tell us your experience of that. Yeah, so I had the uh, the outgoing model uh, over December holiday. So I had the thing for about six weeks. Mm. And you don't realize how convenient having a van is until you've actually had one. Um, mm. With the Ford in particular, you can remove the three rows of seats in the back. Ah. Um, it has like a, a clip rail system in the floor, so you can actually turn the seats around. You can have them in oh. different... Uh, so even like conference-style setup as well. Yes, and, and you can basically... You can have like you can have seats on the one side, so you can mm. put a canoe down on one side. <laughs> you could take all the seats out and have a dance party inside. They are really, okay. really useful vehicles. Um, but what we ended up using it for mostly was for people moving. Um, as you would with a van, usually. Yeah. And that's where the Tornail is geared more for that sort of thing, whereas the Transit is more for commercial, yep. pretty much. So the Transit, or man with a van, the uh, Ford Transit, mm -hmm. it's been around for 60-odd years. The, 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 the Torneo Custom has the, the seating arrangement in it, mm. but they are very, very comfortable vehicles to drive. About mm -hmm. the same as a double cab. Um, you okay. just got to remember that you're sitting on top of the front wheels. <laughs> so, you know, make your turns appropriately. But other than that, uh, vans as a whole, mm. um, you wouldn't believe how big the market is in South Africa because you, you don't see is them it? all that often. But yeah. tour companies, mm. taxi services, the funeral, the funeral industry, believe it or not. Okay. Um, transporting caskets. I know it's a bit morbid to talk about, but yes, um, they make very, very good hearses. Oh. And also, I'd understand for long distance travel as well, or interprovincial, let me put it like that, um, vans would be very useful in that respect instead of just, you know, sitting in a minibus like sardines. Yeah, much. and you can so, yeah. move the seats backwards and forwards. You can move them, you can spin them around so you can have like a face to face conference, like you said, in the back of the van. Um, plenty of legroom, yeah. so much luggage space. They are really, really very versatile vehicles. But mm. yeah, uh, just you wouldn't say that because you never see them on the roads mm. until you do. And then you realize, wow, there's Ford uh, Torneo, there's Hyundai Storia, there's yeah. Mercedes-Benz Vito, probably one of our most best oh, performing yeah, articles. Yes. The best performing articles in the Mercedes-Benz subsection on the side. Um, Volkswagen's oh. Caravelle. Um, every manufacturer has one, but you just, like I said, you almost never see them out on the roads. 
And that's the thing. Like you'd expect to see them, uh, especially in the morning, in the morning commuter traffic, and you're know, taking people to work and that, which makes me wonder, do people really carpool a vans in if that's the case? No, not really. Oh. School run is, is awesome though. Throw mm. all the kids in, they can run around, have a down, like I said, have a dance party in the back. As you would with that sort of thing. Which now leads me to something you don't see on the roads all that much, but then also people verbally um, are perturbed by the sight of a station wagon. People think the station wagon, oh, it's for your gran or your gogo, your grandpa, the madala, the topi, or as you will. But the thing is, I think people also don't understand how practical a station wagon is versus, let's say, a crossover SUV or something along those lines, as an alternative, of course. W- what's your view on that? Okay, so I think it is a, a given that the only people who really like station wagons in South Africa are motoring journalists. We love them. We see them. We, you could pick them out in a parking lot and like everybody gravitates towards the station wagon immediately. I mean, I had it. I landed in Copenhagen uh, oh. a year or two ago. And the first thing we noticed when we walked out of the airport was all of the E-class station wagons. The oh. guys stopped and took photos of them because it's not something that we see. I mean, hmm. my parents had a station wagon. Uh, ah. Toyota Corolla flipping thing was as long as a cruise ship. But it was awesome. It because, worked. Yes, you had... All that boot space plus the rear seat plus the front seat. Mm. I think what d- deters South Africans from buying or, or buying interstation wagons mm. was just as something of that nature was starting to take off, we saw the introduction of SUVs. Yeah. South African motorists prefer the command driving position. They want to be high up, they can see further. Um, and to be I mean, the Grootman. Uh, yes. So station wagons offer exactly the same space as an SUV does in terms of boots and leg space and headroom mm. and all of that. It's just an elevated driving platform. Um, and for shame. some reason, we we just like that. We've gone full American on that because, strangely enough, in America, station wagons also not very popular. Really, in America, of all places. Yeah, Europe. Uh, Europe, Europe is yeah, definitely. Where, so Europe. Germany, Sweden, well, your station wagons are super popular because people use them when they go on holiday. Mm. Skis on the roof, bags in the back, and they still enjoy the sedan like drive um, and the yeah. you know, size constraints. I'd also understand that uh, compared to, let's say, an SUV, it would be relatively cheaper to maintain in the sense that. You get different tire sizing, different brakes, and uh, because there's also less weight to play with as well. Am I, I think, correct in saying that? I think that? our colleague Reno would disagree with you. He's currently in the RS6. <laughs> oh, yes. He's currently driving an RS6 Avant. Uh, the thing has 22 inch wheels. And he, 22s? Yeah. And when they dropped it off, the, 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 the please will you instruction was stay away from potholes. Oh, yeah. Because the rubber bands on those wheels um, are, you will just clip something and it punches it. So, not really. Um, mm. it's, 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 it's all about the driver comfort. Um, you know, the, yeah. when it comes to an SUV, you have the command driving position. I'm not too worried about potholes and I can drive over things that are in the road with a sedan. Uh, station wagon, it's more like a sedan, mm. but it has the space of an SUV. That's so you do get a more performance orientated drive, which is why yeah. I don't understand things like coupe sports SUVs. It's, it's a bit odd. Why would you buy one of those when you can have a beautiful RS6 Avant or... Or in my bias sense, uh, the Subaru Outback. Yeah. It's we, also pretty good. We don't talk about Subarus. Hey, they're awesome. But anyways, <laughs> so uh, let's get on to yes, but no. And Lawrence, this is certainly up your alley because you are the bike man. Yeah. Rider gear. Now... I've seen it on the road so much that uh, some people will wear leathers, which is, you know, the proper jacket, the proper pants, and even shoes, gloves also, uh, to some degree. The typical site, at least in my area, which we're not going to mention because people don't need to know where I live, is um, slippers, shorts, maybe shorts past the knee, and then maybe just a shirt. Okay, if it's a little bit chilly, okay, we'll wear the long sleeve shirt. Now, why is that a problem? Look, there's... For those, okay, I always say there are two types of motorcyclists in the world. Uh huh. Those who have fallen and those who are going to fall. Okay. And once you've fallen and you realize that the tar or whatever else you fall on is very, very unforgiving. And hot. <laughs> and, uh, and it removes bits of your anatomy. Um, Ouch. You, you will begin wearing safety gear. There are a lot of guys that have not had the experience of falling yet and they think they're invincible. 
Mm. We do see it within our community a lot. Guys wearing Crocs, shorts, and a you know, and a, and a tank top, and he's barreling down the freeway at 160. And you're like, when this guy falls, he's going to be missing quite a lot of skin. Ouch! So for those who have fallen, we know it hurts. So wear the jacket, wear the pants, wear the boots. Mm. So as a minimum for when I ride, I have a helmet, I have the armored jacket, okay, um, and my boots. There they are. Um, if you fall off a motorcycle, your first contact point is your hands. Okay. You put your hands out to protect yourself. That's human instinct. We do that. Okay. So the first thing that's going to hit the tar is the palms of your hands. So as a bare minimum, gloves, leather gloves. Proper leather gloves. Okay, we're not going to talk about helmets because helmets are, it's a le- legally you're required to wear a helmet. Mm. So we won't talk about that. But then- What about the Harley riders? <laughs> Well, we'll get into the discussion about full <laughs> face and, and that type of stuff later. But That's a discussion um, for another day, but uh, let us know in the comments if you would like to see that because, uh, yeah, helmets is pretty deep. Okay, uh, so we chatted about it off camera. Then we talk about your second contact point. It's mm. your elbows. Ah. Once your hands go down, your elbows go down, followed directly by that. So you want to wear a jacket that has got arm and shoulder padding. Mm. Then your third contact point is your feet. Okay. And unfortunately, because your feet are at the end of your legs and they flail around, they mm. are the ones that tend to get the worst injuries. Ouch. And, and I, I don't want to go into the types of injuries that we can expect, but, but it's pretty grisly. I have personally seen what happens when you come off a motorcycle. Mm. And the first thing to go is your shoes. The shoes? Your shoes will come off. Jeez. You ever seen a motorcycle? <laughs> the shoes laying in the middle of the road because that's the first thing that comes off. Mm. Your, the joint around your ankle will hyperextend. Your toes, it, it's, it, like I said, it gets pretty grisly. So for me personally, mm. a good pair of riding boots. If you don't have Alpine Star track boots, you know you can have uh, hard leather safety boots. Mm. They don't provide the, the isolation of um, – movement around your ankle mm. so you will still end up with twisted ankles and things like that but at least you're not going to lose your toes mm. or the skin around your ankles or on the bottom of your feet okay um motorcycle safety gear is there to keep the skin on your body so in terms of where people can actually get the safety gear from your typical bike store should have any motorcycle shop worth its salt mm. will have helmets jackets boots gloves Mm. One of the things that uh, you will not see very often is guys with riding pants. So mm. I have I have two different types. I've got leather for track, and mm. I've got uh, a, like a Kevlar woven uh, material mm. um, for adventure. Okay. Now both of these are padded in places in your contact points, so your hips, your knees, and they basically protect you when you fall. Uh, okay. Um. Unfortunately, when you ride a motorcycle and you spend the day in the office, um, it's not always the most comfortable thing to wear a pair of re- leather pants. Um, no. Squeaky. Yeah. It's, it's, so you wear the next best thing, mm. which is Kevlar jeans. Kevlar jeans, okay. Yes. The, the, the jeans have got Kevlar f- f- fibers woven into them. So oh. um, you, you're going to get bruised if you fall, but you're not going to lose any skin because the abrasion resistance of the Kevlar keeps… Ah. And also they touch on this on uh, bike rider safety um, courses pretty much. I know Suzuki offers a safety course for bike riding. Yes. So all of that is pretty much touched on and um, anything else in that instance, particularly with the wear and all that. Yeah. So like I said, I've attended uh, numerous uh, introductory rider courses. It was part of the job. You, you get to see what these companies offer. Mm. I've also spend time on track i've been off-road um and each one of these courses will teach you a little something different Mm. um which the first half of the course is usually what you're supposed to be wearing when you're riding in a particular place Mm. you're not Uh, supposed to look like you're the don of midrand or something look so i i'm an advocate for what we call at get which is at gat all the gear all the time Mm. um because you never know you could decide, hey, man, I'm just going to nip down to the shops quickly for a packet of cigarettes or a, a chocolate or whatever. And you've got your Crocs, your shorts, and your tank top, mm. and you go down the street and some guy T-bones you. 
or pulls out in front of you and you're going to go down and the first thing you're going to do is put out your extremities and then you're going to be wondering, man, it was just a quick two minutes down the road, but mm. that's when accidents happen. So there you go. There's your bike rider safety. Make sure you take those into account and if you have any questions about that, please feel free to ask us in the comments below. Now, let us move on to more event stuff that's going on at the moment in Heat Seekers. So, Samolo Hill Climb, by the time this episode has gone up, will have happened and you are going to be there. So, what's yep. going to be cutting? So, uh, this will be now my third year going um, and I'm going there to cover the Classic Off Friday, mm. the Saturday um, practice and, and time runs and then the Sunday shootout which is all the, the main big classes. Mm -hmm. In between all of this, there will also be some exhibition classes where you'll have electric cars. And then, of course, the other reason why I'm going there, motorcycles. Nice. So the motorcycles run in the exhibition class because we don't really want guys going up there at full tilt mm. um, because it's, it's a, it's <laughs> yeah, pretty much... Somali Hill isn't, isn't exactly the, the, the best place for runoff when it comes to a motorcycle. So they let mm. the guys run up, but it's not time. They don't get official time, so they don't chase um, mm. and put themselves at risk. But yes, um, there will be everything there from pre-war 1915 Model T ca ca type cars all the way up to multi-million wow. rand XF1 cars. Oh, full there wing winged digger mode to the state of the art. street cars, there's modified street cars, there's heavily modified race cars. Just, it's a, a rich tapestry. An automotive enthusiast's dream. Pretty much. Nice, nice. So, yeah. Uh, and also our esteemed colleague, Mr. Chad Lukoff, is also going to be going up, as you may have seen from the last episode as well. And he is going in a C63, the latest one, actually. Yeah, I'm so jealous. That's just been launched. And, ah, uh, man. I mean, there's even a showing of also the more humble cars as well. Like, let's say the Suzuki Swift Sport, for example, yes. which is also going up the hill. And, um, look, small little hatchback, but in the same breath also, it's apt. Because the Swift Sport is attainable, but then yeah. also it's showcasing what the car is also capable and of. The, and the thing is, if you look at the overall times, I think um, the fastest street car does it in like 104 or something like that. So that's like the target time, really, or yeah. benchmark, yeah. let me say. Um, the, the, F, the F1 cars, I think they're like 9 or 56 seconds or something like that. It's stupidly fast. But your the fastest street car is like a minute, four seconds, and then your production cars will be like at a minute, mm. 40, thereabouts. The okay. Swift does it in 158. Imagine. It's only 10 seconds off the fastest street car so it doesn't mean that just because you have all the power and all the speed doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're going to get there as fast as something that's able to put the traction to the ground uh -huh. and handle the corners and, and it's always so fun to watch those swifts go up the hill man i need to do that it's time <laughs> <laughs> now moving on to an ask or to trade a question now this comes from kelesolo if i'm pronouncing that properly and it simply says Hello, I'm in Botswana. What is the procedure to purchase a car and accredited on your site? Now, the first thing I'm going to say is if you are planning to take this vehicle back to Botswana, you do have to know that you have to contend with the likes of SARS, TIP, the import duties and taxes relating to your particular country and everything in between. But also in the same breath as well, you're buying a car that you see off of our site. Lawrence, what is Autotrader first and foremost? So we're a listing site. Um, mm. We host adverts for dealers mm -hmm. and private people who are wanting to sell the vehicles. We do not sell vehicles. Yeah. We, we, we say, hello, Mr. Dealer. Hello, Mr. Consumer. You two meet and have lunch over this particular car that you're selling and mm. you want to buy. Um, when it comes to cross-border trade, it's mm. always fraught with with issues now, I understand countries are our mm. northern borders. Um, they do not have automotive manufacturing of their own, so they are uh, importing vehicles mm. from all over the world. Um, vast majority of them come from us, um, but then we also get um, from Japan and China, Singapore, Singapore vehicles places, that yeah. we don't get here in South Africa, uh, but that can cross border and be driven here for a few weeks to a month or so at a time mm -hmm. now 
as far as a vehicle leaving our side going to them, yes, there is export duties yep. that you will have to pay. Taxes Police clearances and, as well. And all of That's that stuff. Thing. And then on the other side of the border, when you're going back into that country, and they're going to want you to pay import taxes mm-hmm. and road tax and duties and, 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 and. It's, so it's, it's a bit of a fact. It's, it's, it's a bit of a trouble, yes. Um, f- first and foremost, I would say mm. try and buy a car in your own country. Yeah. Um, you can avoid all of the drama. If you're not going to find what you're looking for where you stay, mm-hmm. um, yes, in all means, shop to your heart's content on Auto Trader, but understand uh-huh. that you are going to be in for some serious cash transactions. <laughs> and uh, also paperwork. That's another yes, thing as well. Um, removing that car from the because we have such a problem with um, gray imports and vehicle theft. And a lot of the vehicles that get stolen here ending up across the border. And there's a um, lot of red tape involved. The yeah. SARS and the police are all over that. So they are going, okay, where are you going? Where did you get this from? How much did you pay for it? Okay. Do you have the papers? Yeah. We, we, and, they, and they're going to detain you and give you so much drama. Um, mm. The other thing is, is maybe if you're in Botswana, find a dealer in Botswana who yeah. will be prepared to do all of that for you. I mean, They will source the vehicle from more, South Africa. Yeah. yeah. I think that's one of the best ways to go about it. But then even just another thing uh, worth mentioning, just on the topic of um, the imported cars in these other places from Japan and all that, I can see why getting a vehicle from South Africa would be attractive because of parts especially. Spare parts is a bit of a big thing. For some of the cars, at least I've seen over the border and that, sometimes you have to import parts from Japan, maybe the UK and that, and it starts getting expensive. Whereas next door it's easier to get the stuff. So it would make it an attractive proposition. But as you mentioned, try and find a dealer that side. You know, we don't know what car this uh, individual would like to get exactly, but let's use a a barometer, Corolla, for example. Yeah, It's easy to get parts for a Corolla, at least this side of the world, you know, versus you getting more bespoke parts from Singapore and Japan because it applies to that market. So... What would you advise to that individual as well in terms of what kind of car to get? They weren't very specific about what they wanted. They just said a car. So, yeah, I would say, look, if they're sourcing it from Auto Trader, it means it is one of the brands that we have locally. Mm. It's not going to be some ob thing that you don't find anywhere else outside of Brazil. Yeah. Um, so, as a given, yes. If you're buying it from South Africa, you know that the – the technical support and after sales is handy. You know, a couple of our brands have got cross border dealerships. Mm. Um, there are um, Toyota dealers in Botswana, there are yeah. Toyota dealers in uh, Zim and Mozambique. And mm. so you can get bits and they will source what they need from us. Yeah. Just know that import taxes and duties and things like that will apply if it's Lines something that up. they don't have there already. Yeah. Oh, hope that answers your question. And that's all the time we have for now, ladies and gentlemen. So if you enjoyed this episode, please give a like, share, subscribe, and let us know in the comments what you would like to see from this show. But this is from me, Mr. Tide Zambiri, and my esteemed colleague, Mr. Lawrence Minnie. I'll see you in a few weeks. We'll see you soon, guys. And stay tuned to this man. Well, stay tuned for this man. Sorry, English is hard. I'm getting tired. <laughs> At Smaller Hill Climb and also our esteemed colleague, Mr. Chad Lokov as well, going up the hill. So if you have not seen that footage, be sure to check it out. Anyways, cheers, people. Take care. Search Auto Trader.